Our special guest today is former MSNBC contributor and former co-host of The Cycle, Crystal Ball. Crystal Ball is a University of Virginia graduate with a bachelor's degree in economics. She is a certified public accountant and an entrepreneur. In 2010, she ran for Congress in Virginia's first congressional district. While her run was unsuccessful, she was named by Forbes magazine as number 21 on the magazine's The Top Most Powerful Women of the Midterm Elections. She put on a valiant effort in a race stacked against her. Crystal Ball showed her character as she assisted the recovery efforts after Hurricane Katrina in Louisiana. She showed her resolve against evil as she led a boycott against Rush Limbaugh for his attack on Sandra Fluke. Crystal Ball has a new book out titled Reversing the Apocalypse, Hijacking the Democratic Party to Save the World. Check it out. I got a link directly to it. Go ahead and check that book out, folks. I haven't read it yet, but I will. The challenge is Democrats resettled their roots to FDR's New Deal and advocating a more interventionalist economic agenda. For those who listen to the show, you know that is right to my heart. Advocating a more interventionalist economic agenda. She is the founder of People's House Project, and she's going to tell us all about the project. She's going to tell us all about the book. Crystal Ball, how are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing, I'm doing so well. It's great to speak with you. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. So, Crystal, first of all, I want to uh, congratulate you on the new project that you have, as well as on your book. I saw some uh, reviews, and it looked pretty good. Yeah. I mean, the book, you know, I think we all had this moment after the uh, horrible events of November 2016 when we woke up the next morning and said, okay, what now? (laughs) Should I stay in bed and just pull the covers up over my head? Should I flee to Canada or New Zealand or somewhere else? Or should I dig in and see what I can do to be part of the solution? And um, yeah, I think most people, based on the energy that we're seeing out there across the country, which has been so heartening, have decided, this is my country, I'm going to do what I can um, to, to... make sure that we are staying true to the the principles that made this country great to start with. So um, my personal response was to write initially a very um, passionate blog post about where the Democratic Party went has gone wrong over the years in abandoning um, working and middle class people of all races and genders. Um, And that was called the Democratic Party deserved to die. And then that piece (laughs) sparked enough um, enough thoughts and, and directions for me that I decided to turn it into the book Reversing the Apocalypse. And um, the third phase now is the People's House Project, which is a, a sort of real-world incarnation of some of the principles and ideas that I lay on in the book. Now, one of the reasons that I asked you to come on is um, I was on Daily Coast. You know, I, I am one of your uh, contributing editors there, and I saw the piece that you wrote. And, uh, you know, I first of all, I knew that piece was going to get substantial pushback from a particular sect at, uh, at Daily Coast because one of the things that a lot of people believe is that uh, now with tr- the Trump's victory, the Democratic Party in its shock believes that it has to cater to a particular group and you know uh, whom I'm talking about. And I think in, in, in your writing, some of the people think that basically you're agreeing with that concept in, a, in, in effect saying that somehow we must change or somehow the Democratic Party must change dramatically. I must say that I, I actually agree with that because I think economics is just about everything. But why don't you kind of expand on that and expand on that paper that you wrote? Sure. Well, um, in a nutshell, you know, we have, if you put 2016 aside, um, you just have to look at the results we've been getting over the past 8 to 10 years and you realize that we're in deep trouble. Um, there are very few places in the country left where we really have governing power, and that's a disaster for the people living there. Um, As you know, I live in Kentucky now, and we just for the first time lost control of the state house, and so now we see an all-out assault on working people. We see health care being ripped to shreds, which had been tremendously successful in this state under Democratic leadership. Um, We see women's rights under attack. We see civil rights under attack. We see voting rights under attack. all because we have, you know, failed to, to 
maintain a governing coalition here, and that's true across the country. So step one is just recognizing, you know, it's not just the few thousand votes in Michigan that Hillary Clinton lost by. Um, it is the multi-year and potentially even multi-decade um, decline of the Democratic Party that has left us in such a poor position to affect change for people's lives. And, and I really want to uh, just pause on that thought for a moment because, um, you know, we're, I am a, I'm a Democratic partisan, not because I just, you know, that's my team and go blue. I am a Democrat because we are the only party um, that is a, you know, has a chance of standing up against a horrifying Republican economic agenda and cultural agenda that is just devastating to people across the country. And if we aren't in power, we cannot offer solutions. So that's number one is we've got to make some changes. We've got to do some soul searching and we can't just blame um, Russia, even though I think that's real. We can't blame Comey, even though that was very real. We can't just blame gerrymandering, even though that is very real. All of those things are legitimate but we've got to find a way to be able to win anyway. So um, you were talking about uh, about FDR and sort of returning to that vision of the Democratic Party, and right. you and I, as you already know, are very aligned in the way that we think about these things. Um, FDR's core insight, or one of his core insights, was that at that moment, uh, during the Great Depression, after the Great Depression, it was... Um, it was imperative that we be radical for a generation right. in order to prevent an actual sort of revolution and an actual end of capitalism. And so it was with that insight that he launched so many successful social programs that are still you know, the, the bedrock of our um, country's um, social safety net. Um, we are at another time like that. And um, there is a massive economic transformation that is already underway um, through the, the sort of triple threat of globalization, automation, and greed. Already, the top three most common jobs in the country are um, low-wage, very unstable, very precarious jobs. They are cashier, retail sales clerk, and fast food worker. That's the bulk of the jobs that this economy is creating. And to add insult to injury, um, all of those jobs and many, many more, some researchers say up to 50% of the jobs in our economy are in danger, threatened by automation. So we've got a big, big problem on our hands. And, um, of course, the Republican Party has not been up to the task of dealing with those. That goes without saying. And, and on top of it, lies about their agenda and their intent and are, are absolutely abhorrent in all the ways that, that we point out. But on our side of the ledger, we really haven't offered answers to this new economic reality either. We have certain ideas, things like lifting the minimum wage, um, things like making sure women uh, have access to equal pay for equal work that are important and they're popular, but they do not comprise an economic vision that is going to get people back into the middle class and make sure that they feel their kids have Hope, a hopeful future, and they are also going to be in the middle class. So, um, you know, it, it, if you are speaking with someone who worked in a manufacturing job, a union manufacturing job, and they um, lost that employment or they're worried about losing that employment, they don't want to hear about we're going to lift the minimum wage. Sure, they may support that, but they don't see themselves as minimum wage workers. They don't want to hear about, oh, well, there's this theoretical new green jobs economy, even though that m might be real, those jobs are not showing up in East Kentucky or West Virginia or the um, quote-unquote Rust Belt states in any great numbers. So it's very amorphous. You're going to retrain me for what? There are no jobs around here. Um, and we, we really haven't spoken to that or dealt with that. And to me, if we're going to get back the trust of the people, we've got to start really being bold and aggressive with an economic agenda that makes sense to people, and it's not going to be politically safe, so that's number one. Number two, we've got to run an entirely different kind of candidate. Um, we need to, instead of picking people based on their connection to the donor class, 
We need to pick people based on their connection, their community, and the trust and the authenticity that they have there so that when they run the ads against them that says, oh, they're just the handmaiden of Nancy Pelosi or whoever, people say, that's ridiculous. I, I know this person. That's not who they are. They are, like me, a regular person struggling, and they know what it's like for us and how tough it is right now. Um, that's number two. And number three is we've got to radically rethink our relationship to money in politics. How can we ever, as a party, have credibility as a party of the people when we're sending our candidates off day after day, week after week, hour after hour to New York, Silicon Valley, D.C. cocktail hours to rake in money from people who will never set foot in the district that they're running to represent or when we're chaining them to a phone to dial out to those places to beg for money um, from people who will never set foot in the district that they're running to represent. Um, it's We've got to get off the addictive sauce of this big national money. We are damaging our credibility, and the cost is much higher than what we get out of the ability to spend X dollars on ads. Um, all you have to do is look at what happened with John Ossoff in Georgia. Exactly. Where, go ahead. No, what, you know, I mean, the four races that we that the Democrats lost, I think, first of all, a lot of people were, oh, we came so close. We came so close. The reality is it's not about coming close. It's about winning. And if you can't win okay. in this environment, then there yeah. is a problem. And that's why I think we're, you know, we, we, we have some of the same thoughts because, it is not good enough to win. And not only that, even if we win by a small percentage, you're still in an ungovernable country. So what you have to do is go out there and be with the folks and you have to change minds and be able to promote what promote the reality of what you're trying to do for folks out there. And they'll believe. I wrote a blog this morning about, uh, I don't know if you saw on CNN, they interviewed some of the, um, a whole bunch of Trump supporters, you know, and I wrote this blog saying, hey, guess what? After watching them, as to some, they are going to look like if... They're simply out of their minds and unreachable. But after listening to them, I can reach I can reach some of these folks. I'm not going to reach all, but I can reach right. some of them because what happened is they were speaking based on who they listened to and who what media they were at, attached to, who they had a personal relationship with. And that is something that we don't do. We don't establish those personal relationships that are necessary first mm -hmm. in order to change minds. But Crystal... We could stay on this for quite a few hours and we have to take a quick break. And <laughs> so as soon as we take this break, I'll be right back to you and we'll continue this conversation. And, and my lines, I have to open up for folks to ask a few questions, okay? Okay. Thank you. That's look your Houston area weather and traffic. I'm Shannon McCurchy, and you're listening to KPFT Houston 90.1. Back to you, Egberto. Thank you very much. We are here speaking to our special guest of the day, MSNBC contributor and former co-host of The Cycle, Crystal Ball. Before I go to the phones, and by the way, it's going to be Amy, then Richard, then John. Uh, that's going to be two, then one, uh, two, 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 then one, then three. But um, uh, Crystal, uh, the narrative right now, and this is what concerns me, the narrative right now out there that gives people, uh, that have people believing that, oh, they don't really need to engage some of these other folks is that, well, the Trump voter or the these xenophobes, racist, uh, sexist, uh, misogynist folks out there, right? And I interact with hundreds of people a week, thousands of people through blogging and all these other things that I do, including a whole lot of Trump voters. And I think that is one of the most dangerous things. And I, I tell you one thing. Uh, they a lot of people don't take into account that 15 percent of black men voted for donald trump 20 something percent of uh, latinos voted for donald trump and i can break all the demographics down 52 percent of white women voted for donald trump it's not solely about race and i think a race or or gender and all these other issues and i think people have to get with the program if they really want to solve the issue and one of the things that we all and that is why I'm so depth into the economic side of it. So what do you think about that? Well, you know what? I Number one, I, I completely reject the, the fatalism of oh, Trump voters are just going to be with him and it doesn't matter what he does. I, you know, they're never going to change their minds. And I'll give you just one quick example of mm -hmm. how quickly things can change in politics. I was with a friend, a Kentucky friend, last night who grew up in Paducah, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And when she grew up there... She literally, it was so blue, she literally did not know a single Republican. Wow. Not one. <laughs> and now, now, you know, this would be in a district 
that um, most people would say, I don't believe this conventionalism, and most people would say, oh, there's no way a Democrat can win there. Mm-hmm. Um, so things change. Things realign. People change their minds. The Republican Party is not so popular in this region. Mitch McConnell, mm-hmm. among his own constituents, is the least popular senator in the entire country, and he is the representative of there the Republican go. Party, truly. I th- so um, it's not that the Republicans are so loved. Exactly. And I think that is that that is some of the things that I want to put out there is that uh, you you are in trouble if is even people who are not loved or people who don't share a particular ideology with that. You still can't get their vote. And that's what I meant when I spoke about Asaf and these other elections that we mm-hmm. lost that I think that I thought were very winnable. But I tell you what, let's bring a few callers and let's go to Amy on line numero dos. Amy. Hi. How are you doing, my friend? So, um, as you know, but they may not know, uh, my name is Amy, and I am a co-chair for the Democratic Socialists of America here in Houston. And um, I was calling because we actually have a meeting tonight, and I'm hearing everything that you guys have to say, and you are absolutely speaking my language. Um but I was wondering, you know, Crystal, what would you say to people who, um, you know, are members of the working class and they are sick and tired of the way things are, but the problem is that they are sick and tired and, you know, um, they don't have the money to donate and mm-hmm. they don't have the time to give. What relief do you think that they can find and what, um, and what ways do you think that we can reach out to them to help find those members of the working class who need us the most? Thank you so much for the question, and thank you so much for your um, passionate engagement and activism, Amy. Um, so one of the things that I think is a really central first step and what we're working on with the People's Health Project is actually supporting candidates who are from the working class who know what it's like to struggle to make ends meet, um, to have an unpredictable schedule, to try to juggle child care, to pull up at the gas pump and not be totally sure that the card is going to work, um, to know that you're one health incident or broken down car potentially away from disaster. I think we've got to elevate those folks and those voices in leadership. Um, and that requires not only a, a rethinking of what a leader looks like. Ordinarily, uh, in, in both parties, but I'll speak for the Democratic Party because I have the most experience there, ordinarily we get behind the candidates who can raise the money, who are well-connected, they're usually lawyers, um, they you know, frequently went to Ivy League schools, you know, the type, and, these, and there's nothing wrong with those people. I have friends like that. They, you know, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. But what we need at this moment is people who viscerally understand that challenge and can connect to it and didn't just read a New York Times article about it. Um, I think that is what will lead us to having bolder and more creative um, challenges to the economic status quo in terms of uh, legislative agenda. And I think it is also what will start to rehabilitate the Democratic Party's image. Um, It's very hard to be pegged as the out-of-touch elite party when you're running candidates who are actually working with their hands for a living and, and living the struggle in the current day. And, and you know, at Berta, we've talked about this, too. The working class is also um, the most diverse class in right. America, much more diverse than the population as a whole. So if you open the doors of leadership to working class individuals, you are inherently going to end up with more women and more people of color um, stepping into and being supported, stepping into positions of leadership. So I think that's a critical first step. Amy, anything else you want to ask? Uh, Crystal? Um, uh, well, can I just plug our meeting really quick? Absolutely. You know that's what we're here for, <laughs> Community <Plug> Radio. <laughs> yes. Okay. And first of all, just thank you so much to both of you for um, help, you know, spreading the message to empower the working class. I, I uh, really appreciate that. And if if people are listening today and they're hearing all of this and it really speaks to them, I do have the group for you. You can find us um, on Facebook at Houston DSA or on Twitter at Houston DSA 
or online at HoustonDSA.org. Um, and like I said, we have a meeting tonight at 7 p.m. at 2506 Sutherland. And um, I hope that people can come out and uh, get to know what we're about. Amy, thank you very much. Amy runs a very tight ship and a very well-organized ship. I'll try to make it. Amy, have two other meetings, but I'll sure try to make it, okay? Okay, great. Thanks so much. Take care. You have, you have a, a wonderful day. day. Now, let's go to linea numero uno. Richard, come on in, Richard. Yeah, thank you. Um, I watch MSNBC all the time, Crystal Ball, and I really uh, do respect your opinion, and I agree with it somewhat. However, good luck with changing these people's minds. Look, look what has happened since the inauguration. And look at how many people, 97% still, think the guy hung the moon. I mean, it's hard to change the mind and have a, of, a, of a smart person and, and have them admit mm -hmm. that they've been fooled. It's impossible to, to change the mind of a fool and get them to admit they've been fooled. It's like a dog with a bone. They're not going to let go of it. I mean, you can fool some of the people some of the time, but evidently you can fool 35 to 40% of the people all the time. So, I mean... Good luck with trying to change these people's minds because it, it ain't happening. You know, here's what I, here's the way I see it. It's really pretty simple. We've gotten dumber and we've gotten greedier as a nation, probably as a as a planet. And so it shouldn't surprise anybody when that with that combination of of stupidity and greed that we elect the king of all money pigs, Donald Trump. So that's my opinion. I, I hope I'm wrong. I hope you're more right. But if we haven't changed these minds of these people since, since the inauguration with everything that has happened, that is facts, it's come down the chimney, why do you think we're going to be able to change them in the future? Crystal? Uh, I, I really appreciate the comments. appreciate uh, you, you be, being willing to offer your opinion. And you know what? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you can't. And I can tell you one thing that doesn't work is um, usually the more that you berate someone and tell them they're wrong, the more that they dig in, the more that they dig in their heels and say, no, I'm right, and here's why. I mean, that's, what this, that's not just anecdote. That's what psychology tells us happens. We look, for, um, we look for all the evidence that supports our side, and the more that we're challenged, the more we actually deeply entrench in our beliefs. So um, there is something to that notion, and I think something for Democrats to keep in mind in terms of how we approach this conversation and in, how, in terms of how we approach um, our critique of Donald Trump. What I will say is this. Let's say I'm wrong. Let's say that um, folks who are struggling in the working class right now, they're completely unreachable and they can't be convinced to vote for Democrats. That doesn't change for me one bit what the party needs to do because the party that I sign up to be a part of is the party of working people wherever they live and whatever their background is. Um, that party believes in an economy for the many that works for the working class and that works for a robust middle class that supports union rights, supports working people having power in their workplace. And so whether those folks are going to vote our way or not, my bet is that they, if they see us actually standing for those things rather than just telling them how great we are, if they actually see it with their eyes, and experience it in their lives, they will come around even if it takes time. That is my belief. But even if that is wrong, um, it's the right thing to do. It's the thing we believe in. It's what the party should be about. Fighting for working people at, at its core is what this party should be about. Um, and making sure that every single human being in this country is respected and treated with dignity and, um, and treated equally. So... Those principles, to me, are immutable. I happen to think they also will dovetail with, with winning and winning back power and providing solutions. But even if they don't, it's what the party should stand for. Now, Crystal, and, and before, uh, before you uh, get back, um, go, go back to Richard, and I think this is important because a lot, of, a lot of progressives have the exact sentiment that Richard has, right? I'm a bit more empathetic in the... In, in, in the re I'm, what, I, what I see... Is first of all, I try to see through the, the eyes of others, and I try to see through the eye of the Trump voter. As you know, I live in red, red, I'm in Harris County, which is pretty blue, but I live in a very red area, Kingwood, which is very red. And I sit down in a Starbucks every day, blogging and talking to folks throughout the day over there. And one thing I have noticed, and and what you said is important, Crystal, and that is, uh, it has a hell of a lot to do with approach. 
Uh, my conversations, because everybody in the community knows this is the pinko liberal uh, out there, uh, one of the approaches that I've always used is to have a conversation is, is to listen and have them tell me exactly what they want, what they hope, what are their dreams, what do they want to occur in their, in, in their realities. And what you find out is that the same things they want, and I know it's cliche, but the same thing they want, the same things they want are the things most people people want. So then the reality is that it is something else that's preventing them from getting there. I know you uh, earlier in my blog, you heard me mention about the, the Powell Manifesto and all of that. Well, these guys, the guys that I heard on CNN this morning, the, the Trump supporters, they had to us, a comp they were living in a different realm. But guess what? That realm was put there by some entity. The, the things that they're seeing, the things that they're hearing, the things that they're visualizing came from somewhere else. And it's their reality. And in a lot of times, it is our fault that we allowed that reality to set in. We have allowed those other people to be able to pollute the minds of others because we've left them alone. You know, we've, you know when they talk about flyover country and that sort of thing? I hate to admit it, but I am going to. In a lot of times, that's how, you, you know, you think about what Hillary Clinton did. Hillary Clinton didn't go to Michigan at all. Mm -hmm. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. But, well, and here's, here's another thing I, I would say, just as a, a hopeful point. Um, the health care bill, and that's obviously you know, the, the news of the day. The mm -hmm. Senate have come out with a new version. It's even more terrible. Um, it will be a disaster for people, in particular, this sort of, working class base um, that voted in large numbers for Donald Trump, it'll be a disaster for them. Right. And guess what? It's, it is unbelievably unpopular. People were not fooled by Trump saying, oh, it's great, or by Mitch McConnell or Paul Ryan or Rush Limbaugh or anybody else saying that this piece of trash legislation that would be devastating to millions of Americans, they didn't believe the hype. Right. So that tells me that there's an opportunity here. That tells me that people are evaluating what's going on and considering what it's going to mean for their families. But and you know that's what I mean, that's what we've got to focus is I'm on sorry. where the reality is for average families and how Trump's promises are in no way living up to the reality. Oh. Uh, you wanted to add, tr uh, Richard? Yeah, I understand that, and and again, agree to. S Somewhat, to, to a certain extent. However, she, she didn't go to Michigan because she thought it was a shoe in She thought it was a cinch there right. because of the Flint water fiasco, which was from the Republican Party, uh, mm -hmm. and because of the, of the, the uh, auto industry saved by Obama. She figured Michigan w was in. Here's, here's, I know I'm simplifying things, but I mean, I'm minored in political science here in Huntsville at Sam Houston, mm -hmm. and I know a little bit about what I'm talking about. The very definition of conservatism is, I mean, read it yourself. Look it up in the dictionary. It's not subject to change. Happy with status quo. The very definition of liberalism is subject to change. If you show a liberal a better way to do it, they're going to do it. They're going to say, okay, yeah, fine, let's go. But Richard, way. That's why yeah. you'll change the, the, the minds of the blue Richard. and then the Democrats, but you're not going to. Uh, uh, you know, I know I'm being hard-headed about this. I hope I'm wrong, <laughs> Crystal. Good Lord, I hope I'm wrong. Richard, I hope people open their eyes. Go okay. ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm going to have to let you go because our lines are familiar, but I want to just say one other thing uh, to that effect, and that is uh, people say they're conservatives. You ask them their values. Most people's values come out on the progressive side except on certain specific social issues. So right. again, if you if you put names onto it, they'll say, "Oh, in Texas, everybody wants to say they are conservatives, the people who vote." But you ask for their values, you ask them what they want. They want their social security, they want good ed uh, education, all these other things that are, that are in our platform. Those are the things they want. But anyway, I got to let you go, my Absolutely. friend. Absolutely, I, I do it to them all the time. These people, these friends, right. relatives, and neighbors around here, I do it to the same time. Asking these questions, I said, "That's more in line with liberalism." And as right. soon as you say the word "liberal," man, they get red in the exactly. face. Exactly. Got to let you go, <laughs> okay, Richard. Let you go. Thanks a lot. Thank for you, my brother. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. We got to go to a quick. Do we, do, oh, okay. No, no. So, so let's go to John. John wanted to ask you a question, Crystal. What line? Uh, line number three. Good afternoon, Egberto. Good Hi. afternoon, Crystal. Hi, John. Hello, John. Okay, I, I greatly admire you, and I used to watch uh, the cycle all the time, and also your Thank internet you. show, uh, Crystal Clear. 
Oh, thank you. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, recently, you're on two different Joy Reid programs, and uh, she was disparaging Bernie and creating false narratives about Bernie, uh, support among women and black voters. Uh, instead of talking about you know, economic issues, uh, you gave some very good retorts to her, uh, but you didn't mention how Bernie is one of the most popular politicians in America and how he won 22 states, and how uh, he won 44 percent of the Democrat in the Democratic primary, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and he has the most overwhelmingly has the vast support of millennials. And so uh, I'm wondering, uh, in, in future uh, conversations, do you think that that's important to talk about how popular Bernie actually is? Uh, I do, and. Um it's interesting. I, I mean, if I remember correctly, that's one of those things where afterwards I was kind of like, I should have really mentioned that he's, <laughs> you know, he's the most popular politician in the country right now. And that doesn't make him perfect. And that doesn't mean that he has answers for everything. But I think looking at the way that he talks about the challenges facing our country, um, I, I think there's a lot for the party to learn. And, you know, the other thing that's interesting, um, we're having this debate, and I think maybe one of the debates that you watched was about why Rob Quist lost in special election in Montana to this guy who body slammed the reporter. I mean, it's ridiculous. Someone like that should be completely unelectable. And so, yes, I know Montana is a tough state, but in a situation like that, we should be able to win that seat when the other guy is literally body slamming a reporter on election. That's my view. And I, you know, uh, what I the one of the points that I that I made and that I think is important to think about is they ran all these ads against Quist, the Democrat in Montana, tying him to Nancy Pelosi, saying he's Nancy Pelosi in a cowboy hat. Now I have a lot of respect for Nancy Pelosi. She is a historic figure, and her place in history is secure. And she was an incredible vote wrangler and legislator. But millions of dollars have been spent caricaturing her um, and making her into a a stereotypical, out-of-touch elite who doesn't get the regular people. The problem is not that she's too liberal. That is actually not the the attack on her, because if it was just that she's too far left, then they'd be running ads saying, oh, Rob Quist is Bernie Sanders in a cowboy hat. But you don't see any of those, because even though Bernie is very bold and progressive, in his ideas and, and fearless in articulating them, um, he has done a better job of really giving people a sense that he actually cares about um, the working and middle class and putting economics cent- front and center and, and starting to have somewhat of a vision for how we could make things better for people in this country. So I think there's really something to, to learn there and to think about. The problem is not Democrats being you know, too far left, and now we're starting to have this sort of silly debate about, oh, you know, should Democrats be far left or should they be centrist in order to win? Um, it's, it's a sort of a false choice, and I think we've got to look at the fact that our ideas and progressive ideas are incredibly popular. What's not popular is having people who are, uh, feel sort of poll-tested and are too careful and too safe and who spend all their time fundraising on Wall Street and in Silicon Valley. Absolutely. So, John, we're, we're kind of filling, filling up on calls, and I have to um, get to the other one. So um, sh- we got to go to a quick break. Got to let you go right now. Okay, my friend? All right. Sounds good. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. John. All right. Okay. That's a look at your afternoon commute. I'm Shannon McCurty, and you're listening to KPFT Houston 90.1. Politics done right with Egberto Willi is back to you, Egberto. Gracias. Okay, folks, we are our special guest today is former MSNBC contributor and former co-host of The Cycle Crystal Ball and author of Reversing the Apocalypse, Hijacking the Democratic Party to Save the World. And you can go to our site to, uh, to go ahead and get her book, as well, uh, folks, I'm going to be limiting one quick question to to Ray, to um, Crystal because I want to l- keep the last two minutes for two specific questions. So let's go to line number five with Craig. Line number five, Craig, real quick. Hi, uh, big fan of both you guys. Appreciate the work you're doing. Thank you so kindly. I wanted kindly. to okay. piggyback on to Richard's comments about uh, Im- the impossibility of changing Trump voters' minds. I think that he's pretty much correct. I think the only chance we have of getting progressives in office is if you look at the 
dismal turnout we have for voters in this country, we've got to get the people who haven't been voting. We've got to get, we've got to do sheer numbers against the Republicans because between the brainwashing of Fox News and Breitbart and the basic ignorance of a lot of the populace, uh, these people aren't going to change their mind. And we have to overwhelm them with numbers and and counteract the voter suppression that they're actively practicing. Thanks, Greg. Uh, Crystal, can you give a quick response to that? Yep. We got to do both. And what I would say is, you know, even in a state like Kentucky, um, that is considered deep red, we still have a Democratic Attorney General. We still have a Democratic uh, elected statewide Secretary of State. We have still have Democrats representing um, coal country out in places where Trump got 80% of the vote. Democrats can still win in these places, but you've got to have the right message and the right kind of candidate. Thank you very much, Craig, and keep on listening, keep on calling, my brother. Let's go to line number one with James. Come on in, James. Yes, thank you for taking my call. Yes, sir. Uh, I guess I'm going to turn my commentary into a question then. Okay. Um, why, why with Umberto? Yes, sir. Why are, are you so, I say you now, I'm being delivered. Why are you so focused on following the smoking mirrors? Uh, uh, you know, the people, the information that you're giving out is basically pertaining to the smoking mirrors of the politics and what's going on. Um, and that's not going to lead to anything until the people begin to look at not Trump, not act, not any politician, but the system, the people who push the system that they operate under. The same people that uh, headed Trump campaign, headed Nixon campaign. I forget the name. Metaphor. Yeah. Na- um, uh, what's the yeah, name? So, uh, yeah, he died. I uh, know exactly who you mean. Yes. But no, but there's two more. The one that's in the news now. They're not with the Trump. Oh, okay. Pain anymore. Got you, Manafort. Yeah. But anyway, Manafort and another one. I mm-hmm. can't even remember his name. But anyway, they're still in politics. They are the they are the, the heart of getting presidents elected, even if they're not qualified. But if, until you look at them, all we think, all we're looking at is smoke and mirrors. Okay. But I, the real got it. The system. It's the system. James, I we got. We don't deal with the system. I got, Go thank you. I got, thank you very much for calling us, uh, James. I got what you're saying. I just want to answer in this respect. You're right that it's a system, but it's the people who vote. So we have to get to the system who, who are misaligning folks or misinforming folks. But at the same time, we also have to get to the people. Can you give me a quick response there, Crystal? Yeah, we've got to take some responsibility for the, the people that we're electing in our role in perpetuating that system. Thank you very much, Crystal. Tag, line number three. How you doing? All right, you talk doing? to me, sir. Yeah, uh, Crystal, you said earlier about what needs to be done with the Democratic Party. Mm-hmm. I, I truly believe that people don't understand how the, our country, um, you know, works. And we were, we were built on a social uh, structure. And I guess if you want to call it socialism, then that's fine. But the thing is, is socialism's got to be a dirty word nowadays. And, you know, when the Constitution starts out with we the people... That means all of us, and and yeah. um, so we all get together to try to build a nation, have roads and hospitals and police and fire. I mean, how is it that people can't acknowledge that that is the way that we live and that's uh, the the underpinnings of our society? Thanks. So I'll I'll go and let you guys talk about that in a minute. Thanks. Thank you, Tag. Go ahead, Crystal, real uh, quick. I, I think that he's getting to the core of one of perhaps the biggest problem in history, which is. We will not be able to solve big problems together um, so long as we view each other with such mistrust, right. suspicion, and, yes, even hatred. And, um, unfortunately, that contempt and mistrust runs in both directions. We have to find a way to reconnect with our, um, with our common humanity as a country um, and, and recognize that we all are citizens in this thing together that will be the start of, of how we can, again, start solving big problems together. Thanks, Crystal. Okay, let's go to line number two, MOD. T- talk to me. Hey, guys. Uh, it's easy to lie to someone or even lie to a nation, and they will go with it. But to the guy I said earlier, a little more detail, convincing a, a body of people or someone or a nation that they've been lied to is impossible. Mm-hmm. That there's there's no going back. For well, and it's more of a cognitive dissonance. Um, 
that you don't you can't change. It's it's how people are led. Thanks. The question. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Real quick, MOD. Yeah, it's the question. So the, with the status quo with the last Democratic election and the way, really, I think the only actual hope was Bernie because he actually walked the walk and talked the talk. The 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 status quo just sort of ran him over. I'm just I'm trying to speak for the general Democrat uh, folks, the voters, and and how that sort of blew up and 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 the rollover that 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 debate between the three of them with uh, Trump and Hillary, I've never seen anything like that. How do they neuter any kind of intellectualism and in, 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 in questions to the, the, the candidates? How was that? Was that real? Thanks, I mean, it wasn't what? Reagan and Carter, right? You remember those debates? Yes, yes, we did. So I'm asking, mm. what, what does this do to the Democratic voter like myself when anything of, you know, purpose of the party has been completely routed out and MOD, now, I only have three minutes left, so I mean, I gotta and, let her ask her this, this, this is, uh, other. Why are they try, trying to find uh, what's it called charges right. against Bernie? Thanks. So what does that do to the people? I'm okay, well, thank you. What think of that. Go ahead, uh, Crystal, real quick. Well, that's why we've really got to reform the party. Um, we've got to re. We, it's not just a branding or a messaging issue. It's got to be a different party, and there's precedent for that. If you see the Tea Party takeover, if you see the DLC take over the Democratic Party back in the 90s. There's right. precedent for parties changing radically in a, in a short period of time. Now, Crystal, I want to jump onto economics real quick. You're an economics major. I mm-hmm. personally believe we have a defect in our economy that is actually manufacturing the income inequality, the wealth, the wealth disparity that we see today. And mm-hmm. I also think that the Democratic Party is complicit in maintaining that reality, the core, what we call the establishment Democratic Party. First of all, do you agree? And do you agree that we have to change the manner in which we define what an economy should look like? Yes. I do agree with all of that, and I think we've got to rethink the fundamental contract amongst citizens and between citizens and the government um, in order to solve this problem. You know, we, t- we tend to think of the post-World War II period when incomes were going up and, they were, and income inequality was going down as the norm, when in reality those were very unusual times, and the norm and the type of capitalistic system that we've set up is increasing disparity. We've got to deal with that. Look, uh, look, Crystal, Crystal Ball, thank you so kindly for being, having been a part of this show. I think you've enlightened a whole lot of our listeners. I want folks to remember she has a new book out, Reversing the Apocalypse, Hijacking the Democratic Party to Save the World. You can go to our site, politicsdoneright.com and get in. Folks, People's House Project. Go to peopleshouseproject.org and visit that site. Crystal, thank you so kindly for having been with us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. You have a wonderful day now.